All right. Well, this morning, it is my privilege and honor to introduce our guest speaker. This morning, we have in the house the Reverend Dr. Dana Allen. And what that means is he's incredibly intelligent. All right. He's a reverend and a doctor. He, he went to school. When the Lord called him into ministry, he got his uh, Master's of Divinity as well as his Doctor's of Ministry from Fuller Theological Seminary. Uh, before becoming the executive senate of ECO, which means he is the top dog, is how I interpret that. Uh, in our movement, in our denomination, he came um, from a church he pastored in Florida. Uh, before that, he pastored in California. Uh, he is a seasoned leader and an incredible guy. I've been so impressed. I want to just share this with you before he comes. Uh, as many of you know, uh, if you're a guest with us, my apologies for a little bit of family news, but... As a church, we've walked through a really difficult season. The, the last few months have been hard on us all. And uh, I cannot tell you how impressed I've been with our denomination. ECO has been absolutely brilliant. Uh, from Reverend Mike Clark in our presbytery to Dana Allen and Nate Driesman in our national office, these men have come beside us and stood shoulder to shoulder with us. And my respect and appreciation for ECO has grown tremendously uh, in, the last, um, in the last few months. Uh, some of you may realize I, I did not cut my teeth on a Presbyterian pew, all right? So I'm still relatively new, right, to, to ECO. But the longer, two and a half years, the more I've been involved, the more impressed I've been with our leadership, uh, with their genuine care and concern for the churches that they oversee uh, some of you will remember that uh, uh, Reverend Allen was supposed to be with us a few weeks ago, and he came down really sick, um, but he was so eager to be with us and to step into this moment to help us, and so I am just, uh, again, so grateful for your time, and would you guys welcome the Reverend Dr. Dana Allen. I'm just going to pray for him, and, and then we'll get going. We'll turn him loose. Father, thank you uh, for this man of God. Thank you for his heart for our church. Thank you for the calling you've placed on his life to lead in this movement, to see flourishing churches uh, spring up around the country and eventually around the world. God, I thank you for his eagerness to be with us in the midst of our pain, in the midst of the, the hard moments that we're walking through. And Lord, I pray now that the word that you've given him, that he would deliver it with clarity and passion, and Lord, that you would open up our hearts to receive what your spirit wants to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. And I got to say, we are thankful that Daniel has found his way into eco. Um, We are, are blessed to, to have him, and, and that's like really the kind of denomination that we want to be is a place where, where people who are excited, energetic, enthusiastic for the Lord can find a vocational ministry in our midst. So very thankful for Daniel, and I am grateful to be here finally. Um, uh, it was not COVID that I had, just rest assured, and I have been double vaccinated, so now I am good, but it, it's great to be able to be here, and um, especially in the midst of this season, one of the things I love to do normally is travel to congregations and be in worship and see the good things God is doing. And I haven't been able to do that nearly as much as I would have normally been able to do. And so it is a joy to be able to be here. At the same time, I wish it were under different circumstances. Um, it is incredibly hard when a pastor leaves a church and it is especially hard when that exit is relatively abrupt. People didn't necessarily see it coming. And in the midst of COVID, when you can't do the, the, the farewells and closure that you would normally have, it makes this season incredibly challenging. As if it wasn't challenging enough. I, I think of the, the recent violence that your community experienced and how some of you knew people and, and the challenge that that is, and just to be reminded of the brokenness of our world in the midst of that. Uh, nationally, with the political and racial tension that, uh, that occurs, that is exacerbated in the midst of sometimes a very toxic environment of social media, and we realize grace is not common in our world today, and that makes it tough. And then obviously the 
uh, international global pandemic of COVID, and we probably won't know for years the extent of the economic and psychological impact that that will take on our world. And so it is a challenging time. And I think it was providential that you all in the midst of Lent had this wilderness series. Um, not even knowing some of the things that were going to happen, but it is uh, applicable in that time where we are in Lent in preparation for Easter. But even after Easter, and I don't know if this is just a justification to use my same sermon or not, but even after Easter, we're still in a little bit of a wilderness season. That Easter tide that Emma talked about before Pentecost, Jesus in his post-resurrection appearances is having to work with the disciples to prepare them for a new reality, a new normal of what it's going to have to be like to follow him when he isn't there. And so it's a little bit of a time of wilderness. And as you saw, wilderness can be painful experiences. These are not times where we're just choosing to go camping for three or four days and we bring all the provisions that we have and we know we're going back to a warm bed and a nice shower and we enjoy nature. No, it's, it's more like that show alone. Have you seen that show? It's that National Geographic show and they, they take contestants and they drop them off in the middle of nowhere totally alone with no provisions and they have to fight off the elements They can call uncle at any time and be removed, but the one who stays the longest gets a million dollars. It's kind of like that going through the wilderness, except for we just can't tap out at any time. And the winner doesn't get a million dollars. But the good news is we're not alone. We do it together. And so when we think of wilderness, what what I want to do today is to uh, read for you and to take the text from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 4. And Ezekiel is a prophet. It's in the Old Testament. And the Israelites themselves had been experiencing a big season of wilderness. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. And Ezekiel himself is further taken into isolation in a very disturbing and depressing mass grave place. And yet, like a lot of wilderness experiences, that's where God can meet us. That's where God can allow us to have a a greater love and appreciation for him, a greater reliance on him, and potentially a greater reliance on one another. And so hear the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and I will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord." And so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, I will raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and when I raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. 
and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, and I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a little bit of background on this passage. Uh, If you're familiar with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, God has been at work for centuries preparing his people to come into the promised land, the land of Israel. And he made that promise back to Abram in Genesis. And then we see later in Exodus that the Israelites are held in captivity in Egypt. And God, through Moses' leadership, brings them out of, that, out of captivity into the wilderness. And then through the leadership of Joshua, God finally brings them to the land that he had promised. And when they get there, they're excited. They're thrilled. They're enthusiastic. The promises have been made real. But they also become complacent and disobedient. It first happened that the northern ten tribes of Israel, that they became disobedient to the Lord and to the promises that they had made to him. And so God allowed the Assyrians in 720 B.C. to come in and and capture the northern tribes. 10 tribes of Israel and displaced them into their own wildernesses. Then 120 years later in 600 BC, the southern kingdom had also become disobedient to the Lord and had broken their promises. And God allowed this time the Babylonians to come in and to conquer them and to spread them into their own season of wilderness. And then Ezekiel comes on the scene. It's it's 580 BC. And the point being is that A lot of time had come by. 20 years had gone by since their captivity. This wasn't just like, oh, hey, our guy lost the election, and about four years later, we're going to get another chance at it. I mean, they were displaced with probably no hope, as we see at the end of the text, that they were complaining, "We're, we're cut off, we have no hope, we're lost. They were at a point of utter desperation and complete hopelessness. And God called Ezekiel. And God called Ezekiel, and what God had done in the midst of calling Ezekiel is he takes him on a field trip. I don't know about you, but I loved field trips when I was in elementary. It was so great. We're going on a bus. We don't have to do the things that we always would have done in school. We're going to get to see something new. Now, Ezekiel had actually already been on two other field trips. In chapter 3, God had taken him to see the glory of the Lord, and it was so strong and so powerful that it rendered him speechless for five years. I've never been on a field trip like that before. (laughs) And then the second time in chapters 8 through 11, God, like the ghost of Christmas past, takes Ezekiel back to all the atrocities that the Israelites had committed that had led them to the point now of being displaced. And so here's one more time that the hand of the Lord is upon me. He goes, and he led me into the wilderness. What's going to happen now? And he gets to a valley, and he sees it's full of dry bones. And the Lord walks him around. And he notices, first of all, there's a lot of bones. And secondly, they're very dry. They're not just mildly dry like my grandma's Thanksgiving turkey. God rest her soul. You know that you could choke down still with enough gravy on it. But it's more dry like when my dog gets a leftover rib bone and just pulls every fiber and flesh and piece of cartilage off that. And then it sits out in the sun and it dehydrates from the inside out and is completely dry. That's what these bones are like. And I think we are living in a season of dry bones. Certainly in our larger culture, that there's a great season of spiritual dryness that as COVID started, many people were were looking for uh, answers. Prayer was Googled more times last year or March, April than any other time in history, right? People were, were looking, they were seeking, they're realizing these things aren't doing it for them that had done it in the past. We see that, you know, more and more of our culture begins to not just walk away from Christianity, but sometimes to to be hostile toward it. And so we're in a season of dry bones externally, 
but we might be in a season of dry bones internally. This season is, is very hard on our emotional and spiritual health. And people have felt disconnected from the Lord. People have understandably been worried that we have our job, but are we still going to have our job? Who knows? Am I going to have to downsize? Am I going to have to lay people off? Is my business going to shut down? All of those new levels of questions that bring on anxiety and dryness. For those who are in the older population, what dramatic effects could happen if I get this disease? My, my dad is 83 and he has Parkinson's. He has not really left his house in over a year. The uh, challenge of navigating virtual school and are we going back, are we not going back, and how do I do my job, and all of those things bring on that level of anxiety, as well as all of the political and racial turmoil that we are facing in the midst of our country. And the saddest thing to me has been the way that this dryness has sometimes seeped into the life of the church. The church. The place that's supposed to be life-giving. The place that Paul says we are to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace sometimes are sucking people dry. I just hear countless conversations about people fighting because masks or, or no masks or how do we talk about racial uh, injustice issues and it, it brings up this tension. Uh, a pastor said to me, you know, I was yelled at twice yesterday and I said, why is that? And he said, well, once because we were capitulating to the government and hadn't opened up worship in disobedience. And then another from someone who said we were part of the problem because there were four high school students meeting outside, physically distanced, with masks, having Bible study, and yet we were part of the problem. And he says, you just can't win. And then let me address the elephant in the sanctuary, right? With Eric leaving, it is understandably natural that people will have a variety of feelings and emotions and frustrations. And the question is, what do we do with those and how do we move forward with that? Because people have those feelings and those uh, opinions based on sometimes partial information, sometimes different information from one another, sometimes misinformation. And sometimes what that can do is lead to gossip, factions, and the continual drying of the bones of the church. And it's hard. I remember in my last church when we had a situation that we had to, to do, and we could not give everybody the full picture. And people come up to me, and they were spitting mad. And I had to say, you know what? If I had the same information you had, I'd feel the same way you do. But the reality is, can you trust that the elders who've had a fuller picture have been able to walk through this prayerfully and biblically? And that would be my prayer and encouragement. And I have to say that I think your elders, your staff, the Presbytery, and Eric all walked through this process with integrity. It's challenging, it's messy, it's not easy. Obviously, some things can be different, but I believe everybody has walked through this with integrity. We still have the right to feel angry, we have the right to feel upset, sad, all of that, yes. But the question is, are we going to allow that to continue to suck us dry? Or are we going to use this opportunity to be life-giving? To rehydrate the bones of our church? going forward. And so I love what God says to Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And, and Ezekiel, you, you got to love this answer, right? He says, oh, Lord, you know. What kind of passive answer is that? Here's a guy who has seen the glory of the Lord so strongly that he was mute for five years and now he's eh, maybe doubting the power of God in the midst of this situation. I don't know, God. Those bones are pretty dry. And I have to admit that sometimes I'm like Ezekiel. I'm usually a pretty optimistic guy. 
But sometimes I see the challenges of the world around us, the challenges that we face in church, and the, the obstacles to seeing transformation and flourishing. And if God says to me, Dana, can these boats live? I might say, oh, Lord, you know. I mean, you can, but it's pretty far gone. But what I love is that God doesn't try to just verbally convince Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy. I want you to prophesy over these bones. And Ezekiel says twice in verse 7 and verse 9, I did as the Lord commanded. It's as if it says, I know it seemed crazy to prophesy over bones, but the Lord told me to do it, so I just, I did it. And an amazing thing happened. The bones began to rattle. And tendons began to affix to the bones. And the bones then became attached to each other. And then flesh and muscle and eventually skin came upon these bones. So there was now a big valley of slain people, but lest they be a second helping for the vultures. God says, Ezekiel prophesied to the breath. And just as the breath of God breathed into the nostrils of Adam in creation, so God breathed new life into these slain and they stood on their feet and there was a lot of them there was an army an exceedingly great army now that's a field trip right that's a field trip and god says to ezekiel listen i'm not just showing off my power I'm not just like showing you this cool trick I can do. He's telling Ezekiel, this is why I'm showing you this. Because these bones represent the whole household of Israel. They represent the dryness. And the people have complained, we're cut off, we're dry, we're never going to have our land again. And I want to show you, Ezekiel, that even in the midst of what looks physically impossible or maybe just seems impossible because God has, we think God has cut us off and abandoned us. I want you to see, Ezekiel, that it is possible. That I can breathe new life into dead bones. Amen? And God then calls Ezekiel, but you have to prophesy. And that's the cool thing. God does the hard work, but he calls us, he allows us to participate in that work. We see it in that whole history when, when the Israelites are leaving Egypt and they come to the, the Red Sea. Uh-oh, what are we going to do now? Well, God's going to part the Red Sea. All he asked Moses to do is to say, hold out your staff. Right? It wasn't like that in and of itself changed things, but it was a sign of obedience. Moses, you were participating with me, and the Red Sea parted. When they ended up getting to Jericho, the fortified city under Joshua's leadership, God was the one that took down the walls, not Joshua, but God says to Joshua, I want you to march around, and I want you to blow the trumpets, and I will bring down the walls. God calls us to participate in his work of bringing new life to dry bones. And I am so thankful for the wonderful history of this church that has always been bringing new life to dry bones in the community around us. I, I sort of resonate with Boulder. I was uh, on a plane, I live in Santa Barbara, I was on a plane from Denver to Santa Barbara. Someone was going there and they were talking to their seatmate and said, I've never been to Santa Barbara. And they, the guy said, I call it Boulder, California. <laughs> and so I said, thank you. Just to say that there's some similarities there. That in your culture and in my culture, Christianity is not the norm, right? I mean, we look out and we see the, the dryness around us. We see how much work needs to be done. And I'm so thankful this church for the way that you have and will continue to make grace common to the community around and to see new life come into dry bones. So I know God's gonna to continue to do that for you in the next season. But I also know that right now, not only does God need to bring new life to dry bones out there, but God needs to bring new life to dry bones in here. 
God needs to revive our hearts and souls. God needs to comfort us. God needs to to care for us. Sometimes we need to wrestle with our anger and our frustration and all of those things that we might have in the midst of this season. And the great thing is, unlike that show alone, we get to do it together. We can use our words to build up or to tear down. And it is in this season that it is so vitally important that we allow the Lord to work in us and through us to help bring new life to one another. Who are facing a variety of challenges, could be pastoral transition, could be just obviously all of these other things that are going on. And God has called you together as the body of Christ to rebuild us, to attach our tendons together, to, to put flesh on us so that we can be effective for the Lord in the future. Amen? I know you have masks on, but amen? amen? And I love that we're taking communion today. So those of you who are online joining us or, or in uh, person, if you want to prepare for that. And communion is a great opportunity. You know, when Paul gives his instruction for communion, he gives it to a church in Corinthians that was in the middle of some stuff. And he's helping to remind them that communion isn't just an individual event. And we have always held that in our Reformed tradition. The communion is not something we just do privately, but it's something that we do corporately. That we have the opportunity to be able to examine our own lives, to be able to confess our sins before him. But we also have the opportunity, Paul says, to examine the body, to take stock of who is around us. That we are making a commitment saying, Lord, not only am I going to follow you, but I'm going to walk together with my brothers and sisters as we bring glory to your name. And so I want to pray before we take communion and you give you a time of silence to confess whatever you need to confess before the Lord, but to also ask for, for you to consider how do I commit to this body going into a new season that needs you? That we need, Paul says, us, we need the whole body. And so how do I commit to that body who needs me, especially in the midst of this season? And so let's pray. Lord, gracious God, we thank you for your amazing and awesome power to bring new life to dry bones. The way you did that physically with, in front of Ezekiel and the way you continued to do that through Ezekiel and now to us. Lord, and we know it, it is not us that is the wellspring, the fount of living water, but it is you, and so we celebrate that today. We thank you for the ways that you have forgiven us from the past, the ways that we can look forward to your return and the time when we will all worship in heaven face to face, every tribe, tongue, and nation. But Lord, that we can also thank you that you do not call us to go alone. You call us to be part of your body. We get the privilege of having different gifts, different backgrounds. Sometimes the challenges that produces, but overall that we believe that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so Lord, as we pre prepare to take communion, would, would you allow us, would you hear us as we confess the ways that we have fallen short of your glory and your call in our lives by what we have done or by what we have left undone? And then, Lord, give us the opportunity to recommit to following you and to being a part of the body that you have placed us in. So, Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. And it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed by his friends, but he was with his friends. And he took the bread and he gave thanks to God and he broke it and he said to them, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Let us take the bread. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he gave thanks to God, and he poured it out, and saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. It is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. It's sealed in my blood. Drink you all of this. Do this in remembrance of me. And as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, we thank you that you made grace common and available to all who put their hope and trust in you. That you extend your grace by the power of your spirit to call us into deeper relationship with you, to call us to trust you, to allow us not to go through the Christian life alone, but to go with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for our denomination, for the privilege and honor it is to be a covenanted order. That when part of our body rejoices, we all rejoice, and when part suffers, we all suffer. And I thank you for the way in which we can work strongly, yet sometimes imperfectly as a body, to bring healing and wholeness. And I pray for each one of us here today, for what we come in with, issues from our lives or concerns, challenges, frustrations, hopes, dreams for the future of this church. And we put them all into your hands. We ask that you would meet each one of us at our point of need. That you would strengthen us, guide us, lead us. So that we may prophesy to those who are dry. In our churches and in our larger community and in our world. And so we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.